Good morning, everybody. I've got a question, and I'm hoping on the off chance maybe somebody has the answer. Uh, I have many questions that I'd like the answers to, but uh, I have one in particular. Is there anyone here uh, who learned to ride a bicycle as an adult? That is, or tried to learn to bicycle ride as an adult, who never had experience with a bicycle as a child, but decided as an adult to do that? Anybody do that? Okay, uh, how did that go for you? <laughs> what? Not very well, is that what I heard? Yeah, I, I have a neighbor uh, who's in the same predicament. Uh, she uh, grew up in another country, uh, no bicycles in the village she grew up in. She moved to the United States and uh, she started a family. I met her a few years ago. She had two daughters, uh, has two daughters, one nine, one eleven and they began riding their bicycles down our street, which is pretty quiet. And uh, I don't know whether it was jealousy or the fear uh, that these kids could get out of her eyesight so fast, uh, she felt motivated uh, to learn how to ride a bicycle as an adult, and a couple summers ago decided that was what she was going to do. She bought a bicycle, and uh, I watched uh, for a summer. I, I, I went to work, but when I was home, <laughs> I, I watched her, and uh, as far as I can tell, this woman is neurologically normal in all respects, <laughs> except when she gets on a bicycle, when it's as if she doesn't have a cerebellum. You know, she's just moving back and forth. She just cannot keep it balanced, and uh, literally, her children are riding circles around her down the street, uh, making fun of their mother. It must have been very embarrassing, and by the end of the summer, uh, she progressively used the bicycle less and less, and she's never been on a bicycle again. Now, I, want to t I told you this story in part because I, like most of you, learned to ride a bicycle as a child. Uh, but when I was um, about 28 or so, uh, I began working in St. Louis, and there's nothing wrong with St. Louis and bicycles, but I didn't have a bicycle, and I didn't need one. I was quite busy, and I used a car. I used my feet, uh, but I didn't use a bicycle. And I lived there for about 30 years, um, and uh, I did not use a bicycle for 30 years. Uh, and then we moved back east, and um, after in 2004, uh, my wife Linda in 2005 noticed I was growing, uh, but unfortunately not up, but <laughs> out. And uh, she recommended that we get bicycles. She really meant you get a bicycle, but <laughs> she was trying to be supportive. And, uh, we got bicycles, and I remember very clearly this uh, moment when we went to the bicycle store, and I, I know if you've bought a bicycle, you know what I mean. They, they give you a bicycle, and then you go outside on the street and take it on a little road trip about a block long, and the person who gave you the bicycle is watching very carefully to make sure you come back. So there is, I'm a very trepidatious person generally, but I hadn't been on a bicycle in decades, and I was quite nervous. Uh, I got on the bicycle, and sure enough, I was shaking, uh, and having balance problems, but only for about eight seconds. And then suddenly it all came back, and I was riding fine. And, and the question I'd like you to think about is, what's the difference between my brain and the brain of this woman who, as far as I can tell, uh, is perfectly normal, except she can't ride a bicycle? Uh, neurobiologists think about questions like this, that there must be something physically different. I learned a bicycle ride as a child, and even without rehearsal or practice, it's there. And it's probably there in the wiring diagram of my nervous system. That's the only way you could stably maintain something like that. But what would, a, what would bicycle riding look like? How much would it weigh? Where is it? Uh, and questions like this uh, can't really be answered without getting down and dirty with the deep mysteries of the wiring diagram of the nervous system. Now, humans have mapped uh, many things before. David Van Essen pointed out this uh, huge penchant humans have for mapping the planet. Uh, we've also mapped our genome. This is called genomics. Uh, and if you think about humans, a lot of the information we have doesn't come from genes, but comes from those things we acquire, like bicycle riding through experience. And if you wanted to map those things, you would have to have an omics too, but this would not be the omics of genes, but the omics of connections connectomics, and that's the title of this talk. This is a new term probably for most of you. And so I brought the dictionary definition of connectomics here. It's connectomics and connectomics. It's a 
noun plural, uh, because there's an S at the end of it, but singular in construction. This, as you see, is from Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary in 2019. It's a little bit of wishful thinking. It's a branch of biotechnology, and that is, this is the kind of biology that requires industrialization, so it's a technology concerned with the applying the techniques of computer-assisted image acquisition and analysis to the structural mapping of sets of neural circuits or to the complete nervous system of selected organisms using high-speed methods. It's got to be fast or you'll never finish, as you'll see, uh, with organizing the results in databases. And by databases here, I know you all say, oh, yeah, Excel spreadsheets. No, this is different. <laughs> this is a lot different. Excel spreadsheets just can't handle this job. And with applications of the data in things like neurology and psychiatry, that is, uh, you've already heard maybe from Tom Insel, you've got this sense that there are probably diseases of wiring diagrams, miswiring, connectopathies, if you will. At the moment, uh, there are many diseases of the nervous system, learning disorders in children and certain of the psychiatric diseases in adults, where there is no physical trace of what's wrong, even though they are common diseases. And I believe until we have a kind of physical trace, we're really going to be in a hard way in trying to figure out uh, what these diseases are. So uh, we're going to have to map these things sooner or later. And then there are fundamental neuroscience quest science questions, such as how is all this information that we cram into our brains from birth uh, to gosh knows how old, uh, how is it stored? What does it look like? What is it organized like? And I stole these words by looking at the definition for proteomics or genomics. And in a dictionary like this, you might see the word connectome. I, I suspect that word is going to get in sooner. Uh, and that would be the whole wiring diagram of an animal. Now, how can we do this? Uh, when we began, we thought one way to do this would be to just make every cell in the brain a different color. And we took... Uh, that was, Seems like an ambitious goal, and it turned out it was ambitious, and uh, it, as you'll see, it didn't work perfectly. And we took advantage of one of the amazing things humans have done with all this learning over the past uh, sets of decades, which is we've built uh, an understanding of genetic inheritance so well that we can now take genes from an animal that does not belong, those genes, in a mammal, take, taken genes from a jellyfish, which are for proteins that glow red, proteins that glow green, and proteins that glow blue, RGB, those proteins are now, the genes for those are expressed inside a mouse so that each nerve cell has a random amount of red, green, and blue. And that's really all the color you need to generate all the colors you can see because you only have three photoreceptor colors in your eye, one for red, one for green, one for blue. All these monitors only send out red, green, and blue. Uh, and so we made these what we call rainbow mice. And uh, it, this is basically uh, what they look like. This, you've already maybe seen a picture like this earlier today. These are mice where each nerve cell is its own particular color. Now, the fact that the cells are different colors uh, is reassuring, uh, but we want to use this to map out the connections. And so we have to zoom up a little higher magnification to see what we really care about. What we care about is not the cell bodies, but all the wires that connect them, all that felt work, that greenish, purplish, gray stuff in between is what really matters. And to give you an impression of just what's there, I'm going to zoom up even more, and then we're going to focus through a little slab of brain. And this is a little piece of brain. And as you focus through, you see there's a lot of wires uh, connecting these nerve cells. Uh, in fact, there are so many that even in the thinnest section that we can focus on, there are many wires overlapping, and we can't actually decipher them. So this technique, although it shows all the wires, does not allow us to decipher decipher them. So we have modified this technique so we can look at a subset of cells. For example, here is a, a case where just the inhibitory neurons in the brain, the neurons that send information to try to prevent other cells from being activated, are labeled. And now the density is low enough that I think you can say, yeah, I could probably trace out most of these connections. Those big dark objects that seem to have no labels in them, those are the cell bodies of big neurons that are encapsulated by inhibitory cells all around them. But, but we really do want to see all the connections, and we had to go a step further. And uh, one way to do this was to build a contraption 
that looks a lot like a film projector, and you'll see there are certain analogies to it. And this is just an automatic collection of very thin sections of the brain. This is a tape drive, and the action is up here in this region uh, boxed in there. I'm going to zoom up on that. And there's a, a little piece of tissue, a plastic, uh, plasticized piece of brain in that dark area uh, that's been stained, and it's in a hard plastic block. And it's sliding up and down against a diamond knife, and it's being cut at an extraordinarily thin section thickness, 30 nanometers. That's about a thousandth the thickness of a human hair. And uh, so they're kind of invisible, and they float on water, and then they get to this conveyor belt, and they get picked up. And so we take a block of brain and we linearize it as sort of a film strip, where each frame is a successive depth in the brain. And then we take the film, and we turn it into a library. We take each uh, a part of the strip, and we cut them and put them on a silicon wafer that's very flat. And then we keep doing that until we have a whole library of brain. And then we image them. Here's what uh, a collection of 10,300 sections of a brain looks like. Looks like a bunch of CDs. Uh, and this is a, a large piece. Well, as you'll see, a lot of brain data uh, is in there. And this is what one of those sections looked like. Each of those black objects is one of the sections. And if we zoom up on one of those, uh, that's what a section looks like. And the white spots you see are nerve cells, and the bigger white things are blood vessels. And that area with the red box around it, that's the area where we're going to go in and get enough data to see every single wire, every single connection. And here's an image of that. Doesn't look that impressive. You see the nerve cells in gray and those white blood vessels. But this is an extraordinary picture. Uh, in fact, to show you this picture at its full resolution, I would need a screen about 100 times wider and 100 times taller than that picture up there. In fact, it's so big that in this auditorium, if, if, if we could do that, you would actually have to back up to appreciate it, and then it would look just like that again. It, it's just <laughs> so that's why I showed the small one. Uh, a 10 megapixel camera image is about that size. This is 1,000 times bigger than that. This is a 10 billion pixel image. It's uh, 100,000 pixels by 100,000 pixels. And if we just take one little area and zoom up on this, and this is not a full zoom, but it just gives you a sense of what's in there, uh, it's just little wires cut in cross-section. All these little things are cross-sections of wires in the brain. The important thing to keep in mind here is that's one image of 10,300 images. This is a lot of data. Uh, but once you've done that, you have a block of brain that, in this case, is 100 terabytes. And many of you are probably beginning to know what a terabyte is. That's 1,000 gigabytes. So this is a block of brain that's 100 terabytes. Now, when we began work on this project, we were going at about um, 100,000 pixels per second in the image acquisition. And I could tell students who were prospective in my lab that it would just take 50 years to get this block of brain. And I got no takers. And so uh, we began working uh, much faster and finally got this to the point where uh, we're now going and we can do this a, a terabyte a day. And in 100 days, we got this whole data set. And within a couple of years, we're going to be able to do this at 2 billion pixels per second. And then we could do this whole data set uh, in a day and a half, that's three terabytes an hour. We're not ready for three terabytes an hour yet, but we soon will be. So what does that data actually look like is it's the size of a grain of salt. Uh, there it is. It's pathetically small, but it's a lot of data. Uh, and this is worth keeping in mind. And this is what it looks like if you just zoom through a, a data set like this. If you image it one section after another, you see this a uh, bunch of things moving around. Nothing's actually moving. It's just, it's, it's instead of a time-lapse image, as a movie normally is, where it's a space map. Uh, as we go from one section to another, we're looking at these processes that go into the screen. Remarkable, uh, big myelinated axons, those black outlined objects, nerve cells, the big large objects, dendrites moving around. Uh, but you don't get the full uh, sense of what's in there until you go to higher magnification and you see that there are synapses everywhere. Now, the ultimate goal uh, of something like this is to 
trace every one of these wires. And any child, if we gave a five-year-old a book, of a, a coloring book with 5,000 pictures like this and a bunch of crayons and said, just color in each object the same color from section after section, they could do what we want. And so that's basically what we've done now with computers, thanks to some help from engineers. We have these automatic coloring books uh, that don't require human help, but generate now the entire wiring diagram colored in for us automatically. They're not perfect. They require a human uh, correction. So I want to just end by showing you what you do with data like this. So here is a bunch of cells in the cortex uh, that have been reconstructed. And what we've been after is a dense or actually saturated reconstruction of one little part of brain. This is not dense. This is still sparse. But you'll see in here, there's one little area where we've figured out every single element, and that's that little cylinder around that dendrite. <laughs> that's 600 cubic microns, and we know everything about that little data set. Now, that may seem like a very trivial thing, because the whole brain is like that, but I'll give you a sense of what's in there uh, by just showing you what's in there. There are 600 axons. 40 different dendrites and 500 synapses in that infinitesimally small little piece of brain. It's amazing and depressing. <laughs> There's lots of interesting stuff you can see. Dendrites uh, where axons are growing up uh, along the dendrites. And because I work at an undergraduate campus, where students want to go to graduate school and are willing to do anything for a letter of recommendation, <laughs> We've asked students to count and itemize every single synaptic vesicle in every synapse. And I'll just end with a picture uh, to show you that. And so this is not a um, artist's rendering. This is actual data. Those little yellow dots you see in these uh, nerve terminals are the synaptic uh, terminals, uh, are the synaptic vesicles. There's a remarkably complicated arrangement here. Uh, there's, I'll just give you one last movie of this. And just say that, you know, eventually this will be the kind of information uh, that should give us some idea of how information, like bicycle riding, is stored in the brain. Give us some information about the way uh, diseases of the brain look. We'll have some physical underpinnings. And lastly, it should give us a hefty dose of humility because uh, this brain is a lot more subtle, a lot more complicated, a lot more exquisite and frankly, most of the mundane things we use our brains for in everyday life. So thank you very much.